When Joe Biden was elected, gas cost two forty-three. Biden started choking oil production his very first day. Now, five bucks a gallon. John Fetterman backs Biden and parts of the Green New Deal. Journalists call Fetterman a left-wing champion. I'm proud uh, to, to run on the same ticket as, as a Joe Biden. You're out of gas. Biden's out of time. Fetterman's out of the question. NRSC is responsible for the content of this advertising. Hey, everybody, this is Alina Madison, and you are listening to Story Worthy. Welcome to the Story Worthy Podcast. Here are your hosts, Christine Blackburn and Hannah Stinney. Welcome to Story Worthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm here with Hannah Spinney, and this is a best of Story Worthy. Best of Story Worthy, and tonight we bring you two stories about fear. 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 Now, the first story I know has to do with snakes, and a lot of people have that fear. Yes, a lot of people do. I don't in particular, although I guess I don't. Like, if you threw a snake at me, I don't think I would like it. What if they were on a plane? Well... Is Mike is is Samuel Jackson on the plane? Because then I'm fine. <laughs> and if Samuel Jackson's not on the plane, see if Wesley Snipes on the plane, then we're all going down. I see snakes frequently on uh, hiking in Griffith Park, and I also hear snakes. You can hear the the rattlesnakes. Rattle, yeah, that's not a good thing. No, not so much. But it, mostly the snakes are just those little long black ones, garter snakes, or is it garden snakes? What is it? No, it's garter snakes. Why it's gar? No, gar- I th- believe that both of those are snakes. There are such a thing as garden snakes. And there is such a thing as a garter snake. I like to just snake. combine them and call it a gardener snake. Yes, yes. And he that carries is a around a little that only hoe. Speaks Spanish. That's oh it my is. gosh. Oh honest. oh, I'm ra- see, I'm the racist. All the gardeners aren't Spanish. Sure. The second story tonight is about the FBI being visited by the FBI. Which oh, I, I see. think would be frightening, but for all of us, I mean, if you went, to, you know, it'd probably be intimidating enough to go and report something to the FBI. Right. But when they knock on your door. That's a problem. That's 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 going to send up your blood pressure no matter who you are. Yeah, I suppose so, because they're, they're never going to come with like a prize or like good news. Yeah, yeah they're not the publisher's clearinghouse. They're never going to be like, hey, guess what? You won. It's like, nope. Although I've seen this. Have you seen the show The Blacklist? No. According to that show, the FBI are the stupidest people on the face of the earth. But I digress. Is that, is that what it's about? That It's, it's a one-hour drama? one of the most wanted men in the world who decides to come back and, and help the FBI catch other criminals. Except that how they, he's always leaving them and evading them, and then like he ends up getting the criminal himself. I and see. And they come in after the guy's already dead, and he goes, well, I, here's a smart remark. It's not good. This is what I'm I saying. See. I, I see. I want it to be good. Say uh, James Spader. Oh, yeah. He's I like him. a very good actor. And you're like... You watch a guy like that and, uh, you know, in a show that's not worthy of his talent, you're like, yeah, cash and a paycheck. Not that I wouldn't do it. I'd cash a paycheck in a second from a bad show. But yeah, sure. It's like, it's a lot of money put into stuff. But that's uh, that, Yeah, but that's he has business. a fan base and people are going to watch it. I mean, yeah, they, they always exactly. need content. Yeah, well, that's And the true. FBI is, you know, everybody has a fear of that, really. So it's apropos and it's like, it's worthy of yeah, this actually, time. Yeah, actually, I think that we that we should, perhaps we can create a, a show about an F, a super intelligent snake that works for the FBI. Oh, I see. Combine see? the stories. Yeah, yeah. I like Do that. He's ha- wacky what are, partner. What are your fears, Honest? Do you have any fears? Uh, I, uh, uh, I fear being out of control. This is my number one absolute fear because there's so many literally crazy people in my family. That's why I'm so clamped down. And so, so that's why quiet. you don't like you never like get drunk or get stoned. Right. You never get, get out drunk, of control. Right. I'm always right. I don't. I fear that I will. You've got your finger be, on the pulse. Yes, I always fear that I'm going. I'm a, you know, especially. I mean, now I suppose I could get drunk, but now I'm too old to think that that's fun. Right. But it's like I would never get drunk because I'm like, uh, who knows what I would do? Well, frankly, I probably would have fallen asleep. Yeah, you'd watch like, football first, and go to sleep. The first time I ever got high, I just fell dead asleep. I remember but that. But then like the second or third time I had a, my first anxiety attack. So Oh, that, that I thought was you no I fun. thought your first time smoking weed was the anxiety attack. No, the very first time we were in Jeff Shamita's basement. Yes, Jeff, oh, I'm sure. calling you out. Well, Jeff Shamita, I think I've mentioned this before. He's the guy who he's in high school and his brother and sister are both 30 and 35, <laughs> no. which means he's a complete accident. His parents are like 60. 
<laughs> and so he had the whole basement to himself. He had the one wall painted like a, the cover of a Todd Rundgren album with the prism, <laughs> the lights coming through awesome. the prism. Yeah, and he had a pool table. His right. parents went to bed at nine. And like bean bags. Yeah, yeah. Are you thinking of Dark Side of the Moon? Was that the was that the no, mural? Well, maybe no. It was the Todd prism. Rundgren. No, I got the wrong image in my head. I know it was Todd Rundgren. Okay. Well, I'm, yeah, I, I really it love Todd Rundgren. Been so pink, pink I'll go that way. The point I'll go is, that way. these guys are already been smoking pot, and they decide to lie <laughs> to me and tell me they hadn't been to I get see. me to smoke. So I'm like, yeah, man. So we go and we smoke, and I'm like, yeah, I'm hungry. We're going to be hungry, right? Let's order pizza. We order pizza. I sit on the couch. I fall asleep. I wake up four hours later. Everybody's going home. Pizza's gone. And that's like your, the worst that's your drug whole, experience. Yeah, yeah. that's that was the it. worst drug experience ever. It's, it's, it's number pointless. one, boring. Number two, safe. Number three, you know, it, it, nothing happened. Nothing happened, right. But then when I smoked again, I had an anxiety attack and something happened. So that did not make me Okay, so again. that's your fear then is being out of control. Being out of control is my number one fear. I could see is that. Is that I'm, yeah, that, and that's why I'm totally in control. And you, Christine... <laughs> You know what I like is Christine is frantically pointing at herself, and I'm like, what? What? What do you? Oh, you want me to ask you what your fear is? Okay. Tell me what your fear is. Eyes are like starting to drift out the window, thinking of his childhood in Jeff Schmidt's basement. Yeah, yeah. I'm about to curl up in a ball on the floor. No, you know, I I do have fears, but here's, you know, in more of a lighthearted way, you know, if we were to just list my fears right off the top of my head, it would be easy because it's like antiques, uh, dwarfs, um, uh, you know, old cars. Right, anything old. You don't like things associated with people who are now dead. No, I don't like Black that. Black and white films. Yeah, uh, certain like voices, like, you know, like the, the music that you would hear in The Exorcist. Any choir, a choir of children. Oh, that's, Terrifying. That's funny. That, it, like, that was one of the most beautiful, like, you know, like a religious thing that somehow just became the soundtrack to horror movies in the 70s and for now you for you that hundreds of years of choral tradition is completely spoiled <laughs> by the fact that now you associate it with Damien I'm also afraid of a lot of dogs I have a fear not all dogs but I have a now, I have did, a fear yeah, of did dogs you get bit by a dog or not They're very unpredictable to me and I don't care to be jumped on so there's that um anyway I have a lot of fears but most of mine are more like silly fears Do you know what I mean I yeah. mean, if I were to talk well, about my, I my your real... fear of black and white movies, silly. Well, I, I do have a fear silly. of black and white movies. But if I were to talk about like real fears, yeah. then I guess you would get into like abandonment and like, you know, separation and all those sorts of things. Yeah. And then it wouldn't be as fun of a podcast. No, no, no. I think that misery is much funnier than... <laughs> hey, you guys, before we get to our storytellers, I did want to mention that if you happen to be shopping this Christmas season and you need to shop on Amazon, head on over to storyworthypodcast.com first and click on our banner ad. And then that way, Storyworthy gets a little piece of the action. Right. Don't be afraid. Click uh, on our Amazon banner. <laughs> also, you guys, we have been coming at you now for over three years at no cost to you. Absolutely no cost to the listener uh and now we're asking for money can you imagine Hannes? right no imagine you see we're pbs we're pbs <laughs> without uh, all the like intricate science program or the news organization we just sit here and we talk and talk but we're like pbs you could send us ten dollars well you here's what we did $50. is we so what we did actually is we set up a paypal monthly donation thing and so if people want to donate like five dollars a month which is just a dollar a show or they want to donate ten dollars a month you know, or or twenty dollars a month, then they can do that, and it automatically yeah. comes out of their account. And, and you, it's worth it, people. I mean, come on, you would pay five dollars a month to have us come to your house, and you'd probably pay ten dollars <laughs> a month for have us not come to your house. See that? Yeah, see how that works. All right, so that's happening as well, folks. And of course, follow us on Twitter at Storyworthy. That's always a lot of fun. Yes. All right, so you guys, we do have two storytellers coming up. So let's get Darren Farron in first. Dan Farron, uh, Hannes, here he comes. He's Theater a really of the mind. <laughs> He's a really talented Hello, guy. Hello. He's a storyteller, and he produces a show called Story Salon here in Los Angeles. Story Salon is awesome. It's been around forever, right? You can find him on Twitter at Real Dan Farron. So, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are, put your hands together for Dan Farron. I don't like snakes. I can't figure out why. It's never a strong fear. When I would see them in the zoo, I was fine. Watching them in movies, they never freaked me out. It just doesn't make any sense why I was afraid of them. Now, my grandmother hated snakes, but she was raised on a farm in the Midwest. I live in a city near a freeway. 
The only time I see a snake is in a plastic box at PetSmart. And I'm not quite sure where this fear originated, although there was one occasion several years ago involving my dad that might have left a mark. My parents lived in the suburbs, and Dad was spending his Saturday the way he spent every Saturday, dressed in plaid shorts, a T-shirt, and the always-present Pall Mall unfiltered cigarette hanging out of the corner of his mouth. And Dad liked to build brick walls for no apparent reason. It was therapy for him. He would take his bricks, he'd build a wall, he'd take it down. Well, this day he looked up from his bricks and saw a baby rattlesnake slither across the front yard heading toward the bushes. Dad grabbed a shovel and using all his wild animal skills that he learned in the army and on the mean streets of Pittsburgh, proceeded to hit the snake with the shovel, scoop it up, throw it toward the street, hit it again, throw it toward the street. He did this three times. The snake by that point must have felt like he was in a Warner Brothers cartoon. Finally, Dad gets the snake in the middle of the street. He jumps behind the wheel of our trusty Buick and he repeatedly drives over the snake Until the snake looks like spin art. I asked Dad why he went to such extremes when all he had to do was just bash the snake one time with the shovel. And he said, I wanted to show that son of a bitch that I meant business. (laughs) Now we flash forward to this year. I'm in a basement conference room at the LAX Hilton. There's a trade show going on, and one of the attractions is a 100-pound yellow Burmese python named Damien. The snake handlers, a nice couple with a small son, are letting people pose with the snake for pictures. I watch people from every walk of life pose with this snake. Men, women, old people, young people, people in wheelchairs. No one's afraid of the snake. Even my tiny wife, who weighs as much as the snake, poses with the reptile, smiling from ear to ear. So I thought, maybe it's time for me to face my fears. I'll pose with this snake and take a picture. I had the handler place the python on my shoulders and listened intently as he instructed me to hold the snake gently behind the head. And whatever I do, whatever I do, don't squeeze. As he turns away, I hear the handler say to his wife the one thing that I really didn't want to hear. After this guy, we better get Damien out of the room because of all the heat and the commotion, it's making her really irritable. (laughs) Great. So now my wife is prepping to take the picture. Now, when it comes to pictures, my wife is very anal retentive. She checks the focus. She checks the framing. Let's take another one to be sure. Let's take another one to be sure. All the while, I'm holding the snake on my shoulders, and I am firmly saying to her over and over again, just take the picture. Just take the picture. Just take the picture. Just take the the damn picture. Suddenly, the handler screams to me, you're squeezing him too tight. You're squeezing him too tight. I want to throw the snake on the ground and run, but that would be cruel, and I'm sure it would wind up on YouTube as Guy Freaks Out throws snakes and runs from room like crying little girl. (laughs) So I loosen my grip, and Damien slowly turns and starts to move toward my face. My eyes meet Damien's dead gray eyes, and I begin to wonder out loud, why isn't someone taking the snake off me? The snake's head brushes my cheek, and the handler says, Aw, he wants to kiss you. In my manliest voice, I replied, But I don't want him to kiss me. (laughs) Finally, mercifully, the snake is removed. The picture my wife took tells the entire story. I've been to funerals where I look happier than I do in this picture. Now, usually this is the part of the story where the author tells you that he faced his fears and he conquered them. He beat them. Not this time. I'm here to tell you today that I am more afraid of snakes now than I ever was before. (laughs) And we're back. Oh, that was that was great. I love that. I love the fact that his dad, first of all, instilled the fear of snakes by killing it with his car like 15 times. Right. And then uh, him deciding, you know what, I'm going to face up to it. And getting, it's like, see, you asked me if I was afraid of snakes. I mean, not technically, but if like a 20-foot python is there and you say, hey, can we wrap this around you? Right. I'm guessing I would not react well to that. Did I ever tell you the time that my father hit a bunny on the head, killed a bunny right in front of us with the <laughs> back of a shovel? 
<laughs> no. And the reason why was because we had a cat. I don't know if it was Muffin or Fluffy or Clarence, but it was one of our cats. And mm-hmm. they got a hold of a baby bunny, you know, completely mauled it, but it wasn't all the way dead. No. And my dad felt bad. It was so a he mercy kill. Takes two bricks. It wasn't to shovel, it was bricks because he had <laughs> one brick. He laid the b- baby bunny who was squirming and trying to get away. He laid it on top of one brick. Then takes the other brick and just smashes it right in front of my eyes. Okay, so this is the... So now I have a fear of dead bunnies and my father. I, I, you should have a fear of bricks. There's my I don't know fear. What you're, I don't know. You're totally <laughs> messed up. You should fear the bricks are going to fall on you at all times. You see, he was totally right to do that because that was the merciful thing to do. But he should have told you to go away. I know, right? That, or just say children or, you know, Lillian, get the kids in the house. Something like that. Yeah, that would have been better. Let's call him. Let's call him right now and find out what the hell his problem is. <laughs> Jack Blackburn, it's your daughter, Christine, with Story World. You're full of shit. I never did that. My dad could shit never... Shit for brains. He could never... You know, he did. He used to call me shit for brains. Yes. And your horse's ass. Yes. He would say... Well, not just you. I'm sure everybody No, in the just house. me. He, no, I think he actually... He, you're right. He called all of us that. He'd say, you're a horse's ass. You shit for brains. You're skating on thin ice. Oh, that's a good one. That's what I grew up with. That's something that kids today wouldn't understand because who would go skating on a uh, actual <laughs> pond? Actually, you know what? That's not true. Last time I was back in Wisconsin visiting my cousins who live on one of those medium small lakes in right. Wisconsin, these guys were playing hockey out on the ice Except it wasn't like the middle of winter where it was frozen solid and you're right. completely safe. It's like March. <laughs> and there's still some ice. And I'm like, these fucking guys have got to be drunk on Paps Full of Ribbon because there is no way that ice is going to hold these guys. My daughter has an ice skating app. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and that's no, okay. Why so you know what I think? America's I think my fear team. is my fear is getting yelled at. I don't like to get yelled at, and I think that's for my father. There you go. I, I've nailed it. That's what it is. That's pretty good because nobody likes to get yelled at. I have, but a you fear do of like it. it. You like it worse than, or you dislike you it dislike. worse than most people. You like to yell at people, though. <laughs> you enjoy yelling at people, but you know, frankly, again, who doesn't? Everybody likes to yell at people. No one wants to be. Well, yelled at. if you're yelling, you might, you, maybe you feel more in control, or maybe you have a point. Well, it's also well. See, that's the problem is you can have one can have a point. Like I was watching this. Okay, at work the other day, I was watching this show called Paternity Court. <laughs> okay. And and as you might expect, it's much like our friend Sharon Houston, who produces uh, Daytime Justice. Right. Uh, it's like that kind of show, but it's about paternity. Wow. And, that's the, rough. and the girl who is obviously completely in the wrong, just kept yelling. Like the judge, quote unquote, is talking to the guy who says it's not my baby. And she just keeps yelling over everybody else's conversation. Like nobody's talking to her. And that was an example of she's just yelling for it's like, I'm going to keep yelling until you get so sick of it yeah. that you give me what I want. Wow. And I've met those people at the park. They're, no good. They're, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's also a thing. But we're at, we're at any of Okay, so yelling. that's a fear. We have that's that fear. fear. But uh, Dan Farron, awesome story. All right, you guys. Our next storyteller is Chris Gore. Chris Gore, he's a comedian, and he's also the creator and host of Pod Crash. Are you familiar with this podcast, Hannes? Yes. Uh, weren't, we in, uh, weren't we given an award by the Pod Crash? <laughs> I think we were given a crashy. A crashy by and, the Pod Crash. And we thought it should have been called a potty. Uh, perhaps you thought that. I feared <laughs> that if you handed me a potty, that would be something. And we actually, I got the uh, burnt umber version. No, no. What no, was you, the color? You got one called Steampunk. Um, yes, yeah, Steampunk. I, I picked out the steam, and then I had to explain to you what Steampunk was, and I don't think I've successfully explained that yet. Chris Gore, ladies and gentlemen, he's a funny guy, and he's everywhere. Uh, you can find him at thatchrisgore.com or, that on, Chris Gore. or on Twitter at thatchrisgore. So, folks, wherever you are, put your hands together for Chris Gore. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> As a teenager filled with passion, pointless arrogance, and no publishing experience, I learned everything on the job. My underground magazine, Film Threat, was a project I undertook right out of high school. And I was determined to make the zine an important voice in the discussion of movies. And by important voice, I meant a loud one, of course. One idea to get attention that sounded pretty good at the time was asking a former presidential assassin to review movies for my up-and-coming magazine. Having made friends with fringe film writers all over the country, I discovered one named Jack Stevenson, who was buds with John Hinckley Jr. Yes, the John Hinckley Jr., the man who unsuccessfully attempted to assassinate President Ronald Reagan. But more importantly to me, he was a movie guy 
as he was inspired to action by one of my favorite films, Taxi Driver. Some people are inspired to start a movie magazine, others try to kill presidents, but we both had in common a passion for great cinema. I asked John if he would review Taxi Driver. I thought it would be nice to get his thoughts about the film. And I know he was trying to impress a girl with his plan. I mean, aren't we all? Maybe Jodie Foster would read my magazine. I could impress her myself and without jail time. The review arrived in the form of a letter, and it was a disappointment. It was not the review of Taxi Driver that I'd hoped for, but I'll read it to you anyway. After some pleasantries, which was nice, John said, as for the film review, I don't think I can do it. I haven't seen an entire movie since I've been locked up. Taxi Driver sucks, and I don't want to write about that. Success! He gave his opinion. Hinkley went on to say, By the way, send me Manson's address if you have it. Squeaky Fromm wrote to me. There must be some very small group of presidential assassins and jail-bound celebrities who feel some sort of kinship. Hinkley ended his letter by saying, Do good, be good, look good, and shit good. You'll live a long and healthy life. Regards, John Hinckley. Well, it wasn't what I hoped for, but he did say, taxi driver sucks. That was enough for me, and I published the letter with a snipe on the cover of Film Threat, which read, John Hinckley reviews taxi driver. The quote from Hinckley received national attention, but my magazine did not. In fact, each article that mentioned the Hinckley quote seemed to go out of their way to avoid mentioning the source. I was a very early anti-mainstream media advocate as a result. And worse, Film Threat Magazine and myself then got the attention of the FBI. The magazine and I were added to a watch list, which I guess is something that might happen when you correspond with a presidential assassin, although I did take comfort in knowing that some FBI agent somewhere was getting an education in alternative cinema. This would be my first, but not last, run-in with the FBI. The second was after I moved to Los Angeles and met Charlie Sheen. Charlie had just finished up working on a film called The Chase, and I met the young director, Adam Rifkin. Adam, like me, was into strange alternative films like Legend of the Overfiend, and so was Charlie. After borrowing several gems from my collection, I found myself a kind of dealer of bootleg VHS oddities for Charlie Sheen to enjoy. But one film shocked Sheen to the core. It was a Japanese horror film called Guinea Pig, in which a woman is led to a room, murdered and dissected, effectively autopsied alive. It's not something I personally liked. I'm not one for gore, even though that's my last name, but it was fake. Anyone with the knowledge of special effects could tell it was fake, but not Charlie. He thought he had seen an actual snuff film and he reported it to the FBI. In fact, he turned over his copy of the tape to an agent and gave him my phone number. I waited by the phone for an interview with the FBI who were merely looking to confirm some facts about this snuff film. I was told to turn over my original and then the source of the tape, which was a bootleg video dealer from the Midwest who would reward me the next time I saw him with a beer over my head. After a grueling, nerve-wracking, hour-long interview, I convinced the FBI that this film was in fact a fake. Months later, a story broke in the media that Charlie Sheen was to receive a letter of commendation as a good citizen from the FBI. This story broke in the newspaper and the news magazines and all four news channels. It was the early 90s. There weren't that many channels. The story mentioned a VHS snuff film obtained from a bootlegger that Charlie had turned in. This time I was pleased that my name did not appear. And as one of the few people to make Charlie Sheen look good, I guess I should feel some sense of accomplishment. Uh, There's no moral to the story, except uh, the one that comes to mind with each lesson that I learned on this job. I'm an idiot. And we're back. Ooh, FBI knocking on your door. That's Not strange. Fun. That is definitely and, strange. And having Charlie Sheen be the guy who sent the FBI to your door, that would make you feel like you were really going to be. But I'll tell you something. I know Chris Score, and he tends to get himself into some pretty sticky situations. I mean, I'm just saying. These are two examples. Yeah, But that's I true. think there's more. The first, yeah, the first half is like totally him because he's, 
he contacted a presidential one, you know, assassin or attempted assassin. <laughs> right. right. So then if the FBI comes, you're like, well, OK, I can't be surprised by this. Right. But you would think if you give a Japanese horror film to Charlie Sheen, even if it's 15 or 16 years ago, that can't turn around on you where it's like the last if you do anything with Charlie Sheen, the last thing you think <laughs> is going to call the authorities. Yeah. What are the odds? He's, yeah. he's not going to be the guy. If you he's give not Tom be Hanks the a possible snuff film tape. He will call the authorities. Perhaps. You, give, <laughs> you know, Charlie Sheen, you expect to call and say, do you have any more of these? Exactly. Does he still have his posse? Or who are those girls? He called them his, it wasn't a posse. It was a, no. a, his goddesses. The goddesses. Does he still I'm have them? I'm guessing, I suppose not if he's technically sober now. Well, they were all sober. They were living in like a sober uh, wonderland of tantric sex is what I understand. Maybe they were sober. He was not sober. <laughs> and all that, ten, all that great sex he was having was probably in his own head. Because I'm thinking if you're that drugged up as he was when he was like really. Yeah. I, I don't think your penis works that well. There, I, I said it. I have a fear of Charlie Sheen. There, I said it. That is a very, that is not a rational fear. That's completely, he might, oh, he's here. Our next guest, Charlie Sheen. All right, you guys, we're going to wrap it up right about now. I'd like to thank everybody for helping out the show today, including Sean Merrick, Jorge Reyes, Joe Slepsky, and of course, John Thomas Griffith. You know, he's the guy, Hannes, who wrote the theme song. I, you know, I always deny he exists, his existence because I fear him. I, I fear played him. Ten- I, be- I played I fear tennis with him this morning, yes. and I played tennis with him yesterday. He's very much alive, and his backhand is to die for. You sure he's not a ghost? And on behalf of Dan Farron and Chris Score, and of course you, Hannes Finney, my dear friend and Hello. co-host, my name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story-worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. When Joe Biden was elected, gas cost two forty three. dollars Biden started choking oil production his very first day. Now, five bucks a gallon. John Fetterman backs Biden and parts of the Green New Deal. Journalists call Fetterman a left-wing champion. I'm proud uh, to, to run on the same ticket as, as a Joe Biden. You're out of gas. Biden's out of time. Fetterman's out of the question. NRSC is responsible for the content of this advertising. The future will be amazing, and that's all well and good. But what about today? You can feel the rush of a 400-horsepower Nissan Z or climb to new heights in the all-terrain Nissan Frontier. Light up the road in the all-electric Nissan Aria that feels like a sci-fi dream come true. The future will be great, but today is made for thrill. All you have to do is get in a Nissan and drive. 2023 Aria and Z not yet available for purchase. Expected availability is this spring for 2023 Z and this fall for 2023 Aria.